Good evening, friends. This is Dr. Rajkumar here. On behalf of Indian Psychiatric Society, Vadodara branch, I welcome you to the second of the series of webinars that we are conducting, Brain on Wednesdays. As we discussed, the purpose being to understand the neuroscientific basis of psychiatric disorders, which is essential for diagnosing and managing illnesses optimally. The need to move away from symptoms to systems underlying normal and abnormal brain function is of paramount importance. The goal of this project is to understand the working of the brain right from its development to illness trajectory, trajectories and how this can form the basis of rational treatment modalities. In that series, this today we are going to talk about stress, pathophysiology and illness and the speaker being Dr. Ritwik Chatterjee. Ritwik, the platform is yours now on. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, I'll share the screen now. Okay. Uh, so talking about stress, the pathophysiology and illnesses, um, I just want to start with one story. Uh, okay, this is not the story. This was the joke. Um, yeah. So one story that most of us would have been very common with. So DS, he's a bright young child of five years of age. <laughs> he has a chirpy and enthusiastic attitude toward life. And uh, he's quite naughty and talks in class. But the teachers love him. And he's sharp and quick to answer. So DS, he has now become 15. He started getting stressed about his board exams. He has become more negative about his chances and talent. He gets worried just before exams and has trouble sleeping the night before boards. When he's 18, he decided to take a drop year to prepare for NEET UG. He's irritated most of the time. He keeps obsessing over his preparation and gets worried whenever he scores less in mock tests. Continues. So DS has now successfully cleared NEET. He is now a medical student in a good college. But first year has not been as smooth as he imagined. The coursework is brutal and the seniors are not as healthy. When he went to final year, he had his first panic attack. He was started on treatment, but he stopped after his exams were done. Uh, after clearing NEET PG, he has now become a budding psychiatrist. He is now a first year resident and has realized that everything is not as good as it seems. He started to make mistakes in clinic and the ward. He is not able to sleep properly at night. And he always feels he has slept less and has become asocial and lethargic. So the question is basically, what caused DS to become like this? Okay. So before I go ahead with the stress system, I want to talk about just a few basic points because they will be relevant to us. <laughs> Firstly, the brain is a very complex bioelectrical system with each area and layer having multiple connections to the rest of the body as well as the brain. Uh, the brain is the central organ of the body and all the other systems receive some amount of fine tuning by the brain. The brain is basically a biological computational machine and therefore it relies on all the classical elements of biological systems at genetic, molecular and cellular level. But there is an added level of integration via the neural circuitry. Couple of other points. Uh, brain disorders, as we know, are very significant and complex challenges and they involve many unknowns. When we talk about disorder of the brain, we are uh, sure that they are highly interconnected and also highly heterogeneous. Uh, one thing that I will add from my side was that uh, diagnoses given uh, are usually statistical in nature, but have very low biological validity. And there is no single neurotransmitter or pathway impl implicated in this. Okay. Uh, talking about the magnitude of the problem that we are facing, I want to just compare it to cancer research. <laughs> so in cancer, 
the key to progress in treatment has been fundamental research in cell signaling growth and death. And the innumerable ways these mechanisms can become dysregulated. Equally important is the reliance on clinical insights about the nature, heterogeneity and complexity of multiple types and subtypes of cancer as a framework within which fundamental que research questions are articulated. It is this marriage of confronting complexity and uncovering fundamental biological mechanisms which has led us to be able to give precision treatment approaches in few types of cancer. So uh, this is for cancer in which there is a very clear cut uh, lesion theme. The challenge that we face is much greater because for any disorder of the brain, uh, the illness itself is harder to capture. Uh, when we talk about lesions, they don't uh, look the same for two different people. <clears throat> but just like in cancer where these things did help as long as we had a common biological underpinning, I think one good place to start uh, the underpinning biological pathway might be the stress system. So just to recap that, um, if we really want to understand what is really going on in the brain, we need to have different level of analysis at molecules, cell, circuitry level, behavioral level and clinical trial. We need to understand development from a trajectory point of view from childhood till uh, the elderly. Basic concepts like susceptibility, resilience, cognitive flexibility, neuroplasticity, stress and coping need to be talked about more than just uh, clinics and behavior, but also when we are looking at cellular functioning and molecular changes. So this is basically a picture of how the stress system works. So uh, stressors are divided. I will get to that later. But whenever there is some kind of a stressor, uh, there is a stress response by the brain, which activates peripheral uh, system parts, which are the HP axis and the sympathetic adrenomedullar axis. These will relate various mediators which go on to attach to specific receptors in the body as well as the brain. And these now go on to go for physiological and behavioral changes. And this is what we call as adaptation. So <clears throat> when a situation is perceived as a threat, the brain recruits several neuronal circuits to maintain physiological integrity, even in the most adverse conditions. Detection of different types of stressors requires engagement of different networks. Similarly, even the outflow is going to be via different networks. Uh, stimuli that produces actual disturbance of physiological status like pH, temperature, these are called as physical stressors. And when we talk about psychological stressors, I do not mean uh, what we typically think, but more uh, that um, stimuli that threaten the current state and they are perceived in more of a anticipatory fashion. Example would be predator related things. <clears throat> okay, so talking about the stress system a bit more in detail. So the central component are in the brain. Uh, the ones we know of is uh, parvocellular, corticotropin releasing hormone and the vasopressin neurons of paraventricular nuclei of the hypothalamus, which is probably the most uh, dominant. The CRH neurons of the paragigantocellular and parabranchial nuclei of medulla. The locus ceruleus and other catecholaminergic and norepinephrinergic uh, cell groups of medulla and pons. When we talk about the peripheral limbs of the system, we are talking about hypothalamus, uh, pituitary and adrenal axis, HP axis, and sympathetic adrenomedullary as well as the parasympathetic system. Again, just to recap, uh, if you look at this, uh, stress is something which is leading to behavioral adaptation, but it is not as simple to go through a single 
place. There are different chemicals as well as different nuclei involved. These go on to affect uh, nuclei which go on to uh, affect the peripheral systems like the uh, by uh, releasing CRH or vasopressin or using the sympathetic system. And these finally lead to different changes which are behavioral adaptation as well as peripheral adaptation. Uh, again, the reason I was talking to you differently about anticipatory stressors and physical stressors is because when we actually look at it from a functional point of view, uh, these two different colors, the pink ones are basically ones which are activated during physical stressor processing and the blue ones are more in anticipatory ones. As you can see, although there are few similar places, but there are also different uh, nuclei involved which are not present in the other systems. Right. Talking about uh, corticotropin releasing hormone, so CRH and CRH receptors uh, are not just present in hypothalamus, but are also identified in limbic system, basal forebrain, anterior pituitary, and the central arousal sympathetic systems in the brainstem as well as spinal cord. The central administration of CRH was shown to set in motion a coordinated series of physiologic and behavioral responses, which include activation of the HP axis and the sympathetic nervous system, as well as characteristic stress-related behavior. Uh, there are two types of CRH receptors, CRH R1 and R2, and there are various splice variants which lead to various functions. And in fact, the diversity of CRH receptors of type and isoform expression is considered to play an important role in modulating the stress response by implicating different ligands and different intracellular uh, secondary messenger. Coming to vasopressin, vasopressin which is uh, secreted from posterior pituitary is uh, <clears throat> still majorly working on the electrolyte balance. But when vasopressin of paraventricular nuclear region is secreted, it goes into the HPA system and probably is the second most important modulator of ACTH secretion except for TR. <clears throat> AVP also exhibits synergy with CRH in vivo and uh, when these peptides are co-administered in humans, then uh, they tend to affect, uh, they exert their effect through the calcium phospholipid dependent mechanism. This synergistic effect on pituitary ACTH secretion is also an alternate pathway to influence the uh, consequent HP axis activation at the hypothalamic level. Now, stress response uh, also has an early and a late component. In the early phase, we are looking at rapid physiological changes. So, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system would be the ones which would do the major job here and these are short lasting responses like being more alert, vigilant, appraising the situation, enabling a strategic decision to face the challenge in uh, the initial phase. What about the late phase? That is more hormonal via the HPA axis. It is considered sluggish compared to how the sympathetic uh, adrenomedular system works but it also results in a more amplified and protracted response, which is a long-lasting response. <clears throat> Talking about the uh, sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems, so these are rapidly responsive mechanisms, and uh, we know that uh, they control not just uh, the heart, but also the lungs, GIT, kidneys, endocrine, all the vital systems in the body, and they are tightly regulated by the activity of these two systems. Both sympathetic and parasympathetic systems contain several subpopulations of target selective and neurochemically coded neurons. Now these express a variety of neuropeptides and sometimes also mediators of inflammation like ATP, nitric oxide. <clears throat> 
CRH, neuropeptide Y, somatostatin and galenin are localized in noradrenergic vasoconstrictive neurons. While VIP and to a lesser extent calcitonin uh, gene related peptide are localized in cholinergic neurons. The signal transmitting in all these ganglia is further modulated by neuropeptide released from preganglionic fibers and short interneurons as well as afferent primary nerve collateral. <clears throat> Talking about the HP axis, um, the HP axis integrity and precise regulation of its function are very important for normal adaptive functioning of our, any organism with the taxis. Uh, so under non-stressful conditions, both CRH and vasopressin are secreted into the portal system in a very pulsatile fashion. And this system is controlled by the clock system. <clears throat> Again, um, so basically the clock system ends up activating or modulating the CRH and the AVP <clears throat> secretion. And in fact, during acute stress, the amplitude and synchronization of both these secretory pulse increase. And there is additional recruitment of other uh, secreting neurons. <clears throat> Glucocorticoids are basically the final effectors of the HP axis and they exert their effects via their ubiquitously distributed receptors, GR alpha and beta. Talking about GRs now, so on ligand binding, uh, GR basically dissociate from the rest of the olivers and they translocate inside the nucleus, uh, which is very interesting, <laughs> where they uh, interact with glucocorticoid response elements and can affect the uh, like transcription or translation. Transactivation has been suggested as mediating most of the adverse effect of the glucocorticoids, while <coughs> transpression is considered to mediate mostly anti-inflammatory glucocorticoids um, by inhibiting several inflammatory mediators. Glucocorticoid receptor activation causes changes in the stability of other mRNAs and thus the translation rates of several glucocorticoid responsive proteins. So it's not just changing its own but other proteins in the cell as well. And uh, another thing is both GR alpha and beta has been seen in mitochondria also. So it will possibly be associated with modulation of mitochondrial and energy functioning. Uh, the inhibitory glucocorticoid feedback on the ACTH secretory response also limits the duration of total exposure to glucocorticoid. And this inhibitory response is actually very important to minimize the uh, suppressive effects of these hormones. Now, glucocorticoid mediated suppression of TNF alpha and IL1 beta also appears to be <clears throat> the basis for their efficacy in relieving symptoms of a lot of different inflammatory conditions. Transcriptional interference also happens between activated glucocorticoid receptors and other transcription factors such as nuclear factor KB and uh, activator protein 1. <clears throat> okay, so what is good stress and bad stress? <clears throat> so one thing when I was going through the different research papers while preparing for this PPT was that whenever you talk about uh, stress, every single person who has been uh, researching it makes sure to highlight a point that it is a continuum. There is no good stress. There is no bad stress. It's a continuous state. Uh, it's a spectrum. And this stress response is actually very important in preparing the organism to cope with environmental demands, harness different sources of energy, and shape and fine-tune strategies for different coping mechanisms as well as functions to facilitate learning from experience. <clears throat> but if we have to say what is a good stress response, we can say it is something which entails a rapid rise in circulating ACTH which then triggers a subsequent rapid rise in glucocorticoid 
and after this due to that feedback mechanism there is a swift termination of endocrine stress response so it comes quickly goes away quickly as well doesn't stay for that long and uh, this adaptive stress response can also be seen as the first step in making preparedness of the uh, brain for future stressors of the same general class e to a, a learning from experience and building resilience are basic mechanisms of neuroplasticity and the ability of the brain to reshape itself in response to demand so what would we call bad stress response so chronic uncontrollable stress which basically prevents the cell from returning or the brain to returning to a homeostatic environment again basically instead of the previous normal it has come to what we now say as a new normal now this new normal is termed as allostasis and it also comes at a significant biological co cost which can be termed as allostatic load and this has long term consequences on both neural as well as peripheral function so again uh, just to highlight the point that stress although it is affecting cortisol but this is also related with growth along with the growth hormone also related with the different steroids so all of this can cause increased visceral adiposity and decrease bone and muscle mass <clears throat> another way stress causing sympathetic activation increased catecholamine hp activation causing increased cortisol health behavior like decreased physical activity and increased caloric intake all of these leading to visceral obesity all of these leading to metabolic so whenever we are looking at metabolic syndrome we need to think about whether it is coming due to the disease or something else <clears throat> okay uh, this is just to highlight the fact that if there is a resting microglia and there are peripheral inflammatory cytokines which cross over to the brain blood brain barrier it becomes a pro inflammatory microglia this is now going to try to destroy the neuron around it now this damaged neuron is going to release more and uh, inflammatory markers which is going to cause different uh, different actions again causing this cycle to be prolonged because it will uh, release more inflammatory markers it is going to deplete monomyelin it's going to disrupt the homeostatic mechanisms of the brain so stress related illnesses they can be construed as disorders of stress reactivity just like how autoimmune disorders are diseases of immune responsiveness the biology of susceptibility or resilience to depression is closely linked to the biology of stress reactivity that is the process of perceiving and evaluating different types of stressors coping with them at a physiological and behavioral level and being shaped by experience in anticipation of subsequent exposure and because of this exact reason each individual stress response is going to be unique a couple of things about the immune system and how stress works on it <clears throat> because uh, stress can directly affect immune signaling in two ways by reducing the inhibitory effect of glucocorticoid action or increasing or stimulating the immune uh, system via hp axis and the sam the sites that have increased low pro inflammatory immune reactivity also appear to be related to acute stressor modality so for example social stressors uh, increase expression of pro inflammatory nuclei uh, uh, pro inflammatory interleukin and activated microglia in sites such as psc amygdala hippo signaling pathways and basically which are important for social skill but the immune system can also influence the brain so a neuroendocrine immune feedback loop appears to exist in order to allow the peripheral immune activation to signal to the cns to activate the central system and thus allowing the cns to sense and regulate inflammation in the periphery so when activated during stress the ans 
also exerts its own direct effect, effect on immune organs or cells. This can be immunosuppressive, for example, inhibition of NK cells or both immunopotentiating and immunosuppressing, for example, by inducing secretion of IL-6. During immune challenges, stress causes an adaptive T helper to uh, T helper 1 to T8 to shift. In order to protect the organ or tissues against the destructive actions of pro-inflammatory type 1 cytokines. So basically, TH1 is more of cellular immunity. And uh, this potential protective role of stress-induced TH2 shift against overshooting of cellular immunity often complicate pathological conditions in which cellular immunity is actually helpful, like infections or cancer, or humoral immunity is not helpful, like allergies and autoimmune disease. IL-6 which constitutes the main endocrine or circulating cytokine, plays the primary role in immune stimulation of the human HP axis, particularly in the long term. So both ACTH and cortisol elevations are attained and they are attained on top of whatever was maximum stimulated days of TRH, which is suggesting that there are some additional uh, cells which are also being recruited by IL-6. Now, both glucocorticoids and catecholamine can directly inhibit production of type 1 cytokines, which basically enhance cellular and TH1 formation. So, basically, it decreases cellular immunity and they uh, favor the production of type 2 cytokines, which basically induce humoral immunity. Again, um, there are very significant association between depression onset and polymorphic sites of these genes coding for glucocorticoid receptor or mineralocorticoid receptor, similarly with CRH, uh, R1 and R2. So, uh, this is just to explain how, um, see, if we look at uh, the first thing that we talked about, what happened to that person, DS? Perhaps he was one person who had genetic vulnerability and then he go, had gone through various psychosocial and physical stressors in fact we could possibly call the whole MBBS and residency a stressor this leading to a MDD episode leading to more inflammation inflammation leading to again HP axis dysregulation which leads to more uh, epigenetic changes Inflammation will also cause damage to the cellular component. And uh, again, this will increase vulnerability for further episodes and also cognitive and functional decline. And in increases the structural abnormalities as well. Uh, again, um, just a paper to tell you that uh, there can also be autoimmune response against the brain to promote stress susceptibility. Uh, so, when I was talking about the immune system, I just wanted you guys to have a quick look that there are different inflammatory mediators and uh, we have now have emerging therapeutics which may be able to block these things which are working on, for example, CRP, NFKB, IL-2, IL-6, IL-12, <clears throat> again, a uh, lot of other uh, pro-inflammatory um, cytokines as well. Okay, to summarize, um, what I really wanted to tell you, if there was one take-home slide, that is this one. It's that stress itself is something which is contributing to every single thing. If you take a look at how genetics leads to vulnerability, but stress can also lead, uh, uh, lead to increased vulnerability by early exposure in the mother, during the prenatal, perinatal, and premorbid uh, place. And uh, this vulnerability and stress will cause unbalanced inflammatory uh, response, which can go on to produce a continuous flow inflammatory state. And this can uh, further accelerate aging as well as cause the various psychiatric disorders. So I would like to stop here all, uh, because I would like to move on to more of the discussion with everyone in the audience.
so yeah, uh, Rajkumar sir, I'll uh, hand over to you now. I think Rajkumar sir is not there. Uh, Malay sir? Yes, so do we have any questions in the chat box? Uh, does anybody want to uh, uh, um, just, uh, you know, even uh, speak out their question? It's fine if we are able to do that. Do you have any questions? Do we have? Is, is it Dr. Rajkumar? Okay. So, um, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, uh, give some, uh, uh, you know, uh, questions, uh, which will, which, you know, kind of all of us have to uh, think about is what are these vulnerabilities and, uh, uh, you know, at, at what levels and how do we, uh, you know, kind of, uh, see, we may not be able to really look at the genetics of each and every individual. So just by saying that there is a genetic vulnerability is fine. But does this genetic vulnerability be seen uh, at different points in time in terms of it's some kind of uh, a phenotype, whether it is a, 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 a kind of a cognitive pattern or it is, a, some, it, it is some kind of symptoms? How do we understand that a person is vulnerable? See, we, we would all be vulnerable to something or the other. So how do you judge now when, when you looked, uh, when you gave your example that the person who right from his childhood, he became a doctor and a psychiatrist. So what is his vulnerability exactly? Okay. Uh... Because it has, it has two points. Uh, the, the thing is that one is that if we understand the vulnerability, we may be under, we may, may be able to understand and address the current illness better. And second thing is, if we know the vulnerability for sure, we may be able to predict and so maybe prevent to an extent what is going to come later on in life. So what are your thoughts on this? Okay. Uh, so, sir, uh, I think uh, the issue most of us are facing in this kind of a situation is uh, any genetic, say, uh, vulnerability. What I mean by that is mainly mutations in the genetics uh, will kind of lead to some amount of changes in the mRNA, which will possibly lead to some amount of changes in the protein. Uh, this is what I understand at a cellular level. Now, these proteins, which are normally uh, useful for the uh, cellular functioning, are no longer available here and uh, or possibly not available as well. So, because of this, all of the cells will undergo cellular uh, uh, dysfunction. Now, from what I understand, uh, see, uh, these genes should be probably running by the time of conception itself. So, uh, my understanding might be that uh, it might, these uh, genes may be... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, kind of uh, interrupt here. Uh, what we are saying is very general. What I'm trying to ask you is, uh, are there any specific vulnerability genes? I mean, theoretically, you know, if we have got 20,000 genes, all of them are vulnerable. All of them can undergo mutations. And the various permutations and combinations uh, will produce various kinds of things. Now, when we are looking at stress, because today we are discussing about stress, pathophysiology and illness. So when when you look at the when you look at stress, and the physiology of stress, are there any specific uh, genetic uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, genetic findings mm -hmm. that we know are uh, let's say problematically related to the stress response in human beings? Um, sir, I can't uh, really say when it is at a say circuit level or at a cellular level. Uh, what I can definitely say is when we look at all the developmental uh, uh, developmental variations that we see in children, those children who tend to have developmental disorders are usually having much higher risk for all these uh, stress-related illness. Uh, for example, ADHD, autism, or we can even take the example of Downs. 
so my thinking is that whenever there is some genetic variation it will lead to a developmental variation and this should be something that we should be able to catch on to right so uh, again uh, i'll come to the point is what are we looking at specifically now if you're looking at this person uh, the the example that you gave uh, did he have any developmental abnormalities uh so i was trying to kind of point towards uh, having high intelligence as well as uh, imp high impulsivity and uh, inattention during classes so i wanted to uh, kind of point towards uh, adhd with high intelligence so uh, were they there or it was your yeah, yeah. Uh, no no the, this was a uh, true case sir yeah they, they were there uh, so i felt like uh, this is something Uh, which all of us would have seen uh, possibly in our careers so that's the reason why i kind of wanted to uh, use that as an example because uh, like as psychiatry residents we probably would have seen a lot of other residents from other department as well as our department having different symptoms so so does it necessarily confer a vulnerability or it, there are some uh, uh, you know uh... factors which make them more uh, suitable to such an environment um sir i think it would be both i don't think it would be one thing only uh, i don't think it is purely uh, vulnerability which is causing anything uh, but uh, we also know that uh, when we say uh, pass 10 different people via the same training program there are few people who will have symptoms there are few people who will not have symptoms and when we go and uh, look in detail or in depth into the genetic history of these people we tend to find more uh, like uh, genetic illnesses chronic illnesses uh, signs of uh, brain disorders in those individuals who were showing symptoms during this period okay so again it still doesn't uh, answer my question though uh, you tried to explain i am looking at specifics mm -hmm. i want to be certain that when i am looking at something uh, it it is see, it may not be 100% sure shot but it should point towards something which i need to keep see what happens is most of our patients are not uh, very lengthy follow ups they come for whatever is there at that time they get treated and they go away and if it was unfortunately one episode i mean fortunately for the patient it was some one major episode and he is doing he or she is doing fine we may never see that person again there are there are so many people so what do you think uh, makes different people have different kind of symptom patterns that they have so why does somebody have let's say psychosis symptoms why does somebody have obsessive compulsive symptoms why does somebody have anxiety depressive symptoms why does somebody have symptoms only for a short period of time the rest of the time they are fine uh so sir uh, i would like to answer this question by a bit of uh, i'll say personal understanding uh, this is not uh, so much about uh, me reading from a book but me learning from experience here so i may be completely wrong in this that is the disclaimer that i want to give to the audience uh, so what i've seen is that uh, whenever uh, a person goes through extended periods of stress like this uh, they tend to get two types of symptoms uh, number so the, one of the things that i realized was uh, that when we talk about the brain everything is extremely correlated uh, sorry well connected to each other and when i was talking about cellular dysfunction what i mean is that after one point one of these cells will be giving up on his functioning and when this one is not working someone else has to do this exact function or compensate extra for that function and because of this this will possibly go for uh, this function even quicker uh, again this is what i understand um, this kind of leads to a cascade of different uh, cell having dysfunctions uh, basically which will translate into different systems going into dysfunctions uh, with brain being the earliest uh, signs that we will see because it is the most sensitive organ in the body so uh, 
what i've seen is when this happens is there are two diff, uh, major types of symptoms number one is uh, all the different brain functions will decrease to some extent so this includes things like uh, concentration motivation energy work speed uh, work uh, efficiency things like that sleep appetite sexual desire uh, basically since uh, the whole brain is interconnected i'm expecting all the things to go down the other thing that i tend to see is uh, a loss of uh, control now this loss of control is over one's own thoughts so they tend to get more negative thoughts they tend to get more paranoid compared to before they get, tend to get more uh, over, they tend to overthink more compared to before they have poor control over their own impulses poorer control over their own emotions which they had previously and uh, basically what type of symptoms will come from the first group is what i feel is most of the symptoms will come however someone having low for example attention from the beginning having a process which decreases attention further is going to complain more about that first similarly uh, someone uh, having a little bit of paranoia uh, having ex ex paranoia because of this process can uh, be uh, saying those as the first symptom another thing that i was able to see was that uh, when i was looking at the genetic histories uh, of all the patients i tried to take a three generational family history for most of my patients whenever possible uh, so i tend to see a similar kind of pattern uh, when we see for example obsessiveness in the parent or a parent having ocd uh, to uh, for the kid to also have obsessiveness it may not be ocd but uh, it might be obsessiveness present in say uh, schizophrenia or mdd so i don't know whether the diseases actually correlate but what i do understand is the symptoms uh, tend to possibly have some kind of a genetic uh, outline because uh, few people tend to show more uh, of few symptoms and uh, these symptoms are also seen more in their family. So uh, that is my guess, I would say. So do we have any questions? I don't think there has been any questions. Uh, okay. Uh, I, it's not there on the chat, so uh, is it, uh, are there any I'm questions? I'm seeing a few questions. Do you have an access to the chat? Is there yeah. any questions? Okay, just yeah, yeah. I'm seeing a few uh, questions. Okay. Uh, one question was asked by uh, Dr. Uh, Ashwin Mohan. Uh, at a cellular and molecular level, how can stress lead to suicide? Uh, Malay, sir, would you like to chip in here? Because this is something I think I'll struggle to answer. No, you will have to you know, kind of uh, answer. Uh, I mean, okay. uh, right. on, on so, the models uh, that you've explained, yeah. right? From yeah, yeah. genetics it. and uh, um, how, how does it? That's that. That is what I was trying to. I understand. Uh, you know, kind of uh, ask from you that why does somebody have anxiety symptoms? Why does have somebody just feel minor symptoms of depression? Why is it mm -hmm. some that somebody leads uh, some? I mean, some people uh, have only suicidal thoughts, and why do some people end up? committing suicide and so on and so forth. It means all the permutations and combinations. So yes, yes. Dr. Mohan has asked a mm. specific uh, thing related to suicide. So Yeah. Uh, so Ashwin, sir, uh, again, when we are looking at suicide, uh, I would say that uh, suicide is uh, quite different from uh, the process of stress. Um, when we look at how stress act, uh, affects someone to a extent, we are mostly looking not at the acute uh, ones, but more at the chronic changes. So the acute changes are usually reversed very quickly. And uh, again, uh, they tend not to be long lasting for a long time. Uh, when we look at things like suicide, uh, there are different things. Uh, it is multifactorial. We see some people where we look at uh, say, uh, a person who is going through severe depression is trying to commit suicide. So this may be related to the uh, change in the cellular response of uh, what we call as homeostatic load, uh, sorry, allostatic load. Uh, second thing is, uh, there are also others uh, where we frequently find 
that there is no specific uh, thing which we can point out. Uh, so I would not uh, think that these would exactly correlate with each other. I think, yes, uh, stress would end up kind of uh, exacerbating uh, the like symptoms of stress-related diseases like uh, depression, anxiety. Will it lead to suicide or is it the only thing which will lead to suicide? I am not sure. So are you aware of uh, any... Um... Uh, any, I would not say biomarkers as of now, but any uh, uh, genetic mutations or epigenetic. I, think, uh, uh, I specifically... do remember there were a couple of these which were being studied, sir. Uh, but I will have to get back to you on that. Uh, Ashwin, sir, I will uh, send you a message after this to uh, tell you uh, once I get. Uh, so, 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 see, if we go by what you have explained in your talk today, it is uh, what what people tend to understand stress is, uh, well, it's always an external factor. But the, the point of today's talk is that whether a factor is external or a factor is internal or there is no factor. Okay. What is exactly stress? Uh, so, so, yeah, um... so, so, yeah, so the point is that when you look at different systems, whether when you look at the HPA axis and the components of the HPA axis, when you look at the, uh, uh, the interaction of the HPA axis with other systems, whether this, the, the immune system, whether it is the oxidative system, whether it is bioenergetics, all these systems have because of their individual genetics involved, they have got different set points. And these set points are different from what, let's say, most of the people would have. So everything is on a spectrum. But we know that, you know, if you look at a typical Gaussian distribution, there, there are going to be outliers beyond two and a half uh, standard deviation on one side, beyond two, uh, 2.5 standard deviations on the other side. So what does happen is that over this spectrum, Stress basically means that there is an internal, permanent, different settings. And these settings makes an individual vulnerable. Okay. Now, if, if, if you do not even remember what genes or what epigenetic changes are associated or studied with suicide, okay, forget that. But what it will do is, it is going to have, according to the model that you gave, okay, uh, abnormalities in protein production because genes are necessary for that. Now, these proteins are what? What do they do? Most of the proteins will go in forming the cellular structure because the cell has to have some kind of a, you know, a, a framework on which it will survive. So, cellular structure, which includes membranes, which includes vesicles, everything that is formed, everything that has got a physical form in a cell has a protein component or it has got a glycoprotein component, or it has got a phospholipid component. So this goes into making that. Then we have cellular functions. Many of them are enzymatic functions, second messenger functions, transporter functions. Okay. So when something goes wrong with basic DNA, or if there is nothing wrong with DNA, there is an epigenetic change, which finally causes a problematic conversion of an mRNA from DNA you are going to have a lot of abnormalities in cellular function. Now, over a period of time, you know, right from conception, when different organ systems are being made, including the CNS, these are going to lead to few things. One is not very good quality cells. When it comes to the brain, not very good quality of interconnectivity between the cells. Not very good quality of migration because CNS is all about the brain develops because of cellular migration. So when this is not happening, we are going to land up with a brain, okay, where the overall net cellular functioning and output is compromised. So what is going to happen is that at each and every system in the brain, whether it is the cognitive system, whether it is this, that, it is not going to work in a very cohesive or an integrated manner. So when people have looked at the brain, they have come up, uh, when it comes to suicide, they have come up with numerous things. One is an impulse control. 
Okay. One is an impulse control. I have got an impulse that I want to do something to myself. Most of the time, if the impulse control, that is a top-down inhibition is good, I'll say, kya baat kar rahe, this is just a passing thought. But if that top-down in inhibition is not good, this top-down is the GABAergic system. If this system has got a different setting, it is not, I will not be able to inhibit my thinking. And this can translate into behavior. Now, what another thing is, when we look at the genetics of uh, glucocorticoid receptors, okay, there are certain glucocorticoid GC receptor regulatory elements. Means, these are small proteins which uh, help glucocorticoid molecules bind to the receptors. So, these are regulatory elements. Means, they are like, you know, that kind of thing roughly put. So there are a lot of studies which are being done where they are able to now understand that these regulatory elements, which are small proteins, if there are mutations in their single nucleotide polymorphisms, you are going to have abnormal regulatory elements which will impair the binding of the glucocorticoid molecules to the glucocorticoid and the mineralocorticoid receptors. Now, when this binding is a problem, okay, what is going to happen downstream will be a bigger problem. We know that any hormone that we take, glucocorticoids are hormones. So, when we look at hormones, all these hormones, one of the basic things about hormones is they work well because there are feedback loops. level glucocorticoids ka, so there will be a signal which will inhibit the production of glucocorticoid releasing hormone right from the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the adrenal so this secretion is maintained so a glucocorticoid or a cortisol tone is maintained right this is needed for optimal function now suppose with a genetic vulnerability a person okay a person's cell any cell allows more glucocorticoid to go inside and bind to the nuclear membrane because once glucocorticoid binds to nuclear membrane then it can change the genetic production okay so this is known right there is there is an abnormal protein which is called as fkbp5 in some people when it is abnormal it will allow more glucocorticoid entry into the cell means there is more genetic transcription and an impaired small feedback control. So, it is going to lead in this person to a hypercortisolemic stage right from day one of life. So, stress is that. Now, if you have a vulnerable person like this and he grows up, what is going to happen is he has got a vulnerable system right from day one he or she and there are always going to be something or the other situations going on around him. That is the environmental load. And when the stressors, so to say, are minimal, this will is okay. But even if it is slightly above, not even normal, but let's say slightly above minimal, this person, this individual is going to have a lot of stress related changes in the body because of this vulnerability. Okay. Now, something similar happens to uh, when we talk of something like childhood sexual abuse or childhood early you know early onset childhood adverse events okay two things happen one is that we probably have individuals who have got something like this a hyperactive hp axis from day one and secondly repeated stress induces epigenetic change which will make the system still more sensitive when you look at the development of an individual, one of the first regions of the brain to develop is the amygdala. In fact, when children are born, the amygdala is near normal. But all the other systems, they develop. So, when, when a child faces adverse events or the child faces slight variation from normal, the amygdala fires. And amygdala responses are threat responses. So, a child feels insecure, anxious. Okay. Now, amygdala is a part of the brain development. So, again, it is under genetic control, epigenetic control, environmental influence and so on and so forth. 
right so when we are looking at somebody who attempts suicide this is there in the background that you have an altered hp axis functioning from day one because of uh, abnormalities in uh, response element alleles you have got an fkbp5 abnormality which makes the um, feedback controller problem you will have something where in the amygdala is more sensitive than normal so you have an individual who has all these kinds of things this is very simply put because this is what we are understanding bit by bit it is not the complete story now when this is happening the development that goes on in this individual is not going to be uh, completely along normal lines because all the circuits that are going to form are not going to be able to handle the normal load as well as in a normal person so this individual is already overburdened with an allostatic load means normal situations which we will feel are okay for anybody is an allostatic load for this person so there is a stress susceptibility wherein a person is already feeling you know not feeling it has a system which is working that way challenges of development normal challenges of development are stressful neural circuitry is not well developed neural networks are not mature enough so this thing will go on and on so it will alter reality perception it will have poor impulse control it will have poor top down regulation it will have impaired cognition means even the valence that is given the motivational circuits are not able to or rather not motivated the salient circuit are not able to distinguish between what is salient and what is not salient right okay and then of course you have all the other things in case we are just talking about the brain but what about the immune system you mentioned about pro inflammatory and anti inflammatory uh, interleukins and tnf and stuff like that right so this is the vulnerability now unfortunately this vulnerability is not really really specific or causative of something these are associated findings but these are strong associations so, you know maybe 25 years down the line some of this might be uh, causative okay but this is what we are working on right so when we are looking at patients the thing is yes it is good to have a three generational history but a three generational history is just an observational history right unless and until we know hardcore genetics of each of this individual it will be a matter of conjecture okay and that is why we need to take more information than what only the history gives us where what we need to look at is not very clear now because you know 20000 functioning genes but there will be 20 million genetic products and interactions which is impossible and that is where we go into that area of Uh, omics and artificial intelligence where we are able to gather in data and make some sense out of it but again it is in infancy so when you explain your model at each and every point we know something something let's say i would say less than 1% but we know something and this is a starting point for us as clinicians to figure out what we need to do okay clinically because this individual who has got a vulnerability is going to decompensate slowly when it goes on and on it will lead to a neurodegenerative disorder later on or some kind of degeneration not, maybe not be neurological in nature but otherwise or will land up with stress that's a, a system which is already compromised situation who are dealing with a situation stress and the same thing repeated itself so this is what is meant by stress it is nothing to do with what is an external situation external situation can be be a b c x y z but my first question to myself is that given this kind of a situation in a class of 100 mbba students why do only very few have that kind of a problem okay then we look at as you mentioned resilience and all this kind of thing again resilience externally will seem like coping but internally are there any other things that are kind of countering the effects of all these things 
so what is the amount of learning that can happen okay when you look at learning you get into other systems which, which are learning and memory systems which are glutamate dependent so we keep on you know uh, looking at these things with the hope that we'll find something where we can uh, do something about it so the answer to dr ashwin mohan's question is this that it's something to do with genetics it's something to do with epigenesis it's something to do with development it's something to do with the developing brain and the developing systems vis-a-vis -vis environmental situations which are the circuits that are not functioning well which leads to poor decision making which leads to poor impulse control which is which doesn't enable one to learn from past experiences and so on and so forth abnormal salience this is what biology has to offer okay this is the model on which suicide happens from the biology perspective that is what i am trying to tell you over a period of time what happens with acute stresses acute stressful situation okay which will trigger something let's say the we are looking at the hp axis so when people are faced with catastrophic stress okay it can actually fire even a normal hp axis much more than normal so when a person who is apparently normal facing a something like a catastrophic situation the hpa fires more than normal can trigger all these things again in a shorter frame of time okay so it is necessary that when we uh, are faced with patients when patients come to us with this kind of a complaint we look at everything when we when we are taking the history it can give us a lot of details we will not be specific we they'll tell us about situations but what it pointer it will give us is that yes this is something where a person is not able to deal well with and if and there are certain what you will say remainders kuch to baki hai pehle ka kuch to incomplete resolution hai and how does it affect further on that is the trajectory point of view any other questions were there uh yes sir there are few more question um, yeah sure. take it so one was uh, dr jatin dhaman he asked sir how do the response to stress change as we age yeah so uh, jatin uh, dr jatin basically uh, what i was trying to kind of also point out was that whenever we are looking at this stress response it is going to be a very individualized kind of response it is not something which we can uh, easily predict because like uh, sir said there are a lot of combinations or permutations uh, do they change according to age yes definitely uh, again uh, i would just want to go back to uh, my powerpoint first oh sorry there's no screen share here um yeah Yeah, you can use a whiteboard and tell us. Give us the important points. That's okay. Okay. So basically, uh, what I wanted to say was, uh, when we are talking about stress specifically in the brain, uh, what uh, the stress response system tries to do is, it tries to neuromodulate somehow by increasing functioning inside the cell, by increasing, say, branching uh, between the cells. and uh, with this what we typically will see is uh, that there is a growth with experience and each stressful event is also priming the person to having a similar response or possibly a more optimized response uh, when a similar class uh, similar kind of uh, stressful situation happens again again uh, we will take stress as a context here of uh, it being mainly uh, continuous change uh, inside the environment uh, again cellular environment uh, malay sir would you like to add to that anything no i think we discussed in the last this thing yeah, that systems will right. mature right uh, and, yeah. and the and the type of neurodevelopment or the development that happens in the various brain structures individually Uh, in the brain networks when we look at the combination of different parts of the brain okay look the the development of other systems the maturity of the endocrine system the maturity of the immunological systems okay now everything develops a human being that is born on day one doesn't have all systems 100% go 
we develop over time and all systems develop at different speeds and mature at different times even in the brain the maturity is brain maturation and brain development is not uh, uniform across the brain right now as i said uh, i mentioned in the first question is that amygdala is something which is like almost near completely developed when an when a child is born but if you look at the hippocampus it develops over time if you look at prefrontal cortex it, it the development goes well into the third decade of life so systems mature okay but maturity is again is not a linear com component maturity depends on again a couple of uh, three four things main being the genetics epigenetics because that lays down the framework then we have external environment which the person faces over time we do not develop we do not live in vacuum we live in an environment where it throws us challenges and it depends on how we deal with it how we deal with it and what the effect it has on us okay this is how and of course uh, you know development is again not cellular development it also synaptic development so some synapses let's say uh, when the adolescent starts when the puberty starts uh, synapses which are there from birth till, till let's say 11 or 12 years many of them are not found to be useful they need to be pruned away now if the pruning is again incomplete we will have useless synapses and which will take which will make a lot of background noise if you look at the whole fun functioning of the whole brain so this basis this forms the basis of learning plasticity it has to be plastic it cannot be permanent because if it is not plastic will if it is not i mean if it is not plastic will not be able to learn remember as we said correct so development again is not linear so the answer to the question is that systems mature over time the maturity is not one step it's not uniform across systems in the brain and in different regions okay and it is always going to be a dynamic thing under the influence of what is basic and what is what are the challenges that are present um there is another question uh one specifically for you sir this by dr divya sharma uh in cell ubiquitin pathway take care uh to malay sir in ubiquitin uh, cell ubiquitin pathway take care of uh, cellular processes of protein homeostasis and also vulnerabilities help in evolution also it appears mechanism to check the malformed protein is at multiple levels and the cellular loss with age can be attributed to genetic vulnerabilities but in a cell it can be a loss of function or a gain of function or silent so i think uh, she wants to basically understand whether uh, these kind of changes sir only lo uh, lead to loss of function or gain or can they also be silent uh, the rest i so, think so for the so, so yeah so the thing is that yeah that is a big question so for that we need to understand each and every cellular function or protein function and we also need to understand uh, what are the components that manage that function so now let me put it this way that see if if we consider uh, let's say uh, uh, a cell the cell as a structure okay it is just not a fluid blob it has a structure and this structure has got a protein infrastructure means there are protein fibrils and stuff like that so as as the cell grows older as the cell keeps on working these proteins are going to undergo wear and tear so the one of the functions of inflammation is that when proteins let's say cellular proteins are damaged they have to be removed and they have to be replaced otherwise the cell will die right so what is that thing the damaged cells have to be made soluble means wo fiber hai usko liquefy kar do wo excrete kar do okay now a significant number of proteins are in this service maintain cellular integrity second one is cellular processes which are enzymes so structure and function very roughly okay now if we have something going wrong with this 
when you need to function efficiently, you cannot work on an airtight budget. You need to have flexibility. Okay. If you say that I am going to uh, have a project which is 100 rupees worth, you cannot actually function with 100 rupees. You need to have 200. There has to be a buffer. So all cellular functions have got buffer zones. Means, koi protein kharab ho gaya. Okay. Wo thoda pura eliminate nahi hua. Koi problem nahi. Cellular functions will be enough, which will not take care of that. So cells will function optimally. Now the question is not high or low. The question is optimal or suboptimal. In, in physiological systems, there is nothing like high or low. It is optimal or not optimal. Optimal means everything is working in balance. So when it comes to cellular proteins, if that cellular protein generation, degeneration cycle is okay, okay, it is optimal. If the proteins are not clear, they will start accumulating. If they start accumulating, they will start damaging everything nearby. That is where we get neurodegeneration. Okay. So when you look at neurodegenerative disorders of later life, when you look at various dementias, whether you look at all those prion diseases and all that, this neurodegeneration, why does it happen? Abnormal proteins, so instead of being soluble, they remain insoluble. So the cell is clear. Karega. Cell is not able to clear it out of their system. So they accumulate. They start damaging other neurofibrils, means which the, the, the supporting elements which are there in neurons. And the cell dies. So it is optimal or suboptimal. There is nothing called a supraoptimal. If there is anything called a supraoptimal, then it means that we have not really understood what is optimal. Optimal is it is going to work without any difficulty. The regeneration, degeneration is in balance. All processes are working as they should. And the place of that cell in the entire system or the physiology is okay. That is optimal. So yes, within a certain limit, some amount of plus minus is okay, tolerated, will not harm the cell. So yes, some cellular protein change may not be problematic. So it is neutral. So there is good, or there is optimal or not optimal. That's all. Um, so one question by Dr. Shri Hari Prakash Chinnaturai. Any novel practical applications to reduce stress? Uh, sir, I would like to answer that first. Uh, Dr. Shri Hari, sir, uh, the concept is uh, we are just getting possibly a bit of what is happening at each step. And uh, at this point, uh, are there any specific uh, treatment for this? Uh, yes, we do have a lot of medications which do work on these uh, systems that I talked about. Uh, do we have exact knowledge about how they work is uh, still a question that we have yet to answer. Uh, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all the medicines that we use and a lot of medicines that we do not use would have an application in this process is what I see. Uh, Malesa, would you like to add? So what is the question? I Just repeat that for me. Uh, so the question was that uh, are there any novel uh, practical applications to reduce stress? Again, so it is uh, what we are defining stress as so from today's topic stress is not something external it is what our physiological system perceives as stress it is what kind of settings i have in my systems whether it is endocrine system whether it is cns or peripheral nervous system or my gi system or whatever system that is that setting which is when a setting is improper or whether it is not adequate, not optimal, it is going to lead to some problem which I'll experience in the form of some symptoms. Now, if you're looking at stress from an external perspective in terms of stressors or situations, the point is that as human beings, we will have to try and manage situations optimally. Now, there are a lot of factors which will enable us to handle situations optimally. 
वन इज आवर लेवल ऑफ ट्रेनिंग आवर लेवल ऑफ एजुकेशन आवर अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ द प्रॉब्लम हाउ वी नीड टू मैनेज आवर सेल्स बट इफ आई हैव अ वलनरेबिलिटी देर आर सो मेनी थिंग्स दैट वी टॉक्ट अबाउट सो मेनी थिंग्स दैट रिफिक टोल्ड अस अबाउट वलनरेबिलिटी एंड हाउ इट यू नो अनफोल्ड इट सेल्फ ओवर टाइम इफ देर इज अ वलनरेबिलिटी वॉट एवर वी डू एक्सटर्नली मे नॉट रियली प्रिवेंट what is happening inside the body that's the long and short of it okay mm-hmm. and But, since as as ritwik said that we are learning at least from the biological perspective of what 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 are the various players and what do they do and what we can do about that we are beginning so we need more information we need information that is translatable into something which is bedside which is applicable in a day to day practice which we are not there yet definitely not there yet but till that time if we are able to uh you know how would we put it simple techniques that can make an individual comfortable we can use it with whatever we are uh, with, with whatever modalities that are available to us we have any more questions uh, yes sir uh, dr divay uh, so the few of these questions have already been answered uh, yeah. dr divay uh, one question you asked about was i think the uh, markers that i showed in inflammation and whether there are any clinical implication of those markers uh, dr divay uh, trials are going on we don't have the data yet do they have a potential yes uh, do they work we still do not know for a, a lot of these medicines for a few medicines we have some preliminary data some seem to be helpful is all i know of uh, whatever i was able to find okay uh, further on another yes. question from dr divay uh, does intelligent correlate negatively with vulnerability so uh, dr divay uh, i don't think it is as simple as that uh like uh, malay sir was explaining during the first question uh we are looking at a change in say the developmental trajectory from the uh, i think conception time itself uh what we are looking at is developmental deviation uh my thinking would be that uh, high intelligence would also possibly correlate with Uh, issues but even low intelligence could also co- uh, possibly correlate correlate with the vulnerability so i don't think intelligence specifically correlates negatively with vulnerability okay uh uh so uh, another question by dr divay should we stay in a specific given environment it's genetics which decides fate and in a given specific genetic it's environment which decides fate uh uh i think sir uh, it is it is very simple uh, yeah genetics decides but if it was always like that that we need to be in just one space human beings would not have moved out of africa or from wherever and be in india and places like that so what happens is that environment or has an impact on the genome you know, immediate effects and if we stay in that environment for long we have to it is imperative for the human organism to adjust to the environment so there are going to be certain changes and these changes will only come over generations and generations and generations only if there are certain changes so we have got maybe some genetic changes some epigenetic factors and so on and forth so on and so forth so it is not necessary that one has to be in the same environment because the same environment often will not give enough challenges or situations for learning right and and that we have evolved to what we are right now you know we are uh, talking to each other over zoom and things like that would not have happened if we would just have you know stand of stayed in our caves and not really ventured out okay uh one i think this is a statement by dr divay again uh, overshoot of activity will lead to mania and exhausted cells will lead to depression uh, devesh sir i think uh, that would be a very wrong statement to say mainly because uh, when we are looking at a single cell 
uh, we are not looking at a single cell. We are looking at all the connections that it has, including things like uh, uh, where there are interneurons which go back and give a negative feedback. So let's say that an interneuron which is giving a negative feedback has decay. This is going to lead to hyperactivity of the cell it is regulating. Similarly, vice versa. So I don't think it can be simplified to that extent where we say that mania is excessive activity and depression is exhausted activity. I feel uh, it will be a mix of a lot of things in everyone. And the second thing is, uh, I think these will be very uh, personalized kind of symptoms. So we may be able to see patients where they have both of these things, um, mania as well as depression-like symptoms, and they might have... Uh, say, overshoot of activities of a few cell uh, systems and few systems are working at a lower activity. Uh, this is what I could think of. Any more questions? Um, uh, no, sir, that's it for all the questions. Okay. I think uh, we had a great discussion. And, uh, well, this is what is the fun of uh, learning uh, the biology of things is uh, it's, it's always an endless uh, quest for learning new things, finding out new things. There's always discovery. There are always disappointments. And uh, there are always things that uh, are going to confuse us. And when we try to understand them, they'll confuse us still more. So it's 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 a process. And uh, I think we need to be on this process because uh, what we understand or what, well, what I had understood so many years when I started learning physiology in my MBBS, this is much different from what it is now. Um. So thank you, Dr. Ritwik. And with that, I hand over the proceedings to Dr. Rajkumar, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ritwik. And thank you, Dr. Malay, for conducting the session. I thank all the participants for having joined. And I thank Alchem Neurosciences for providing the logistics. Good night to all of you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.